Well, welcome. Uh, Aloha, I don't know if you were going to do any introduction or should I go ahead and just get started? Yeah, please, John. Go ahead. Okay. So welcome to the session uh, today. We're going to discuss, uh, we've got a great panel of speakers on how blockchain is going to provide a level playing field for Africa and financial inclusion for millions of Africans. So I will be starting it off and talking about kind of just a little introduction on some of the things that are happening in blockchain now uh, and how that might affect Africa and the diaspora. And then Deidre McIntyre will be speaking about uh, how from the African-American perspective and how we really connect those things. Uh, Dr. Jones uh, will be talking about how Africa is ready for blockchain on the continent. And Ian Bellina, who's really very well known in the crypto space as well, will be talking about how blockchain is an investment vehicle uh, and finding the best uh, ways to invest in this space. So we will be going through that at the end. We're gonna have about 20 minutes for people to ask questions. You can put them in the chat or you can put them uh, just audio. You can raise your hand, I think, and you should be able to go ahead and ask your questions and we'll try to field those. And we're recording the session, Loha, correct? So people will be able to watch this later as well. Uh, welcome, Emmanuel, uh, French to English interpreter. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel. How, how are you going to do it, Emmanuel? Are you going to just do it real time while we're speaking, or how will you do the interpreting? Um, okay, um, I'm going to interpret simultaneously okay. as the session is going on. Great. Okay, so I'll try to speak more slowly. You have to slow me down if you need to, if I can talk fast. So, All right, let's go ahead and get started. We'll let people continue to join here as we go. So I'm going to begin an introduction here. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Is that okay? Good. Okay, so what we see here is these are just some Africa crypto projects. There are many. Uh, Odua coin is there on the left. There's a coin, which is pretty famous from Acon. Uh, Stellar is not African owned, but it is uh, doing a lot on the continent as is Cardano. Uh, and then of course, Bitcoin, kind of the king of all the coins. And there are stable coin projects, um, which are, you'll hear about those probably a bit later, like the Nigerian central bank digital currency and others across the continent. So a lot of different cryptocurrency and digital asset projects that are taking place all across Africa. Some are African owned, some are focused on Africa, um, but we're going to talk about those and some others associated with that. So why is it a big deal for the developing world? Well, we know that for most of the developed world, everybody's got pretty easy access to bank accounts, to loans, to business capital, but that's not true in the developing world. In the developing world in Africa, of course, it's very hard to get that capital or very hard to get a good interest rate or get access to liquidity of funds. So what cryptocurrencies do is they allow for that access where it was previously not possible. Sorry, I'm gonna let the translator jump in. You wanna? Translate. Emmanuel. Uh, oh, okay. It's uh, uh, Adib Bithar. I sent a greeting from um, English to French. I'm doing French to English. Yeah, John, um, uh, the participants can switch between channels if they click on the interpretation yeah. uh, tab down there. So okay. you, you don't need to post. I don't need to pause. Okay, great. Yeah, okay, you. so places like Zimbabwe, um, what you see is that Zimbabwe. Okay, I do need to pause. <laughs> the Bitcoin. Oh, desolé, uh, they, is it yeah, Mr. They, Degwite that is uh, disturbing you? Um, do I need to pause or I don't need to pause? No, you continue. Just continue. No, okay. no, no. It's it's automatically enabled. Emmanuel, I'm assigning you now. Uh, to uh for the interpretation from english i think uh, uh, Emmanuel, whenever they, whenever they are speaking english he doesn't need to interpret anything he yes, will correct. interpret whenever they speak in french so that we just interpret for the audience who don't understand yes. the french okay so for zimbabwe for instance they've been moving towards bitcoin nigeria central bank digital currency uh, and the transparency also makes it much easier to transact where well, we don't need to be worried about, you know, was this a legitimate transaction? Did the funds go where we expected them to go? The entire blockchain is visible um, basically publicly. So there is a lot of benefit for Africa, for diaspora, and the ability to transact using the, the blockchain in these ways. I'm not going to play this, but what this does go through is in South Africa, CNBC did a report 
um, some time ago where they talked about how easy it was for people for Zimbabwe working in South Africa, for instance, to use crypto if they wanted to send funds home versus the difficulty of being able to send funds other ways, like the, I think they call it the money bus or whatever it was that they would you know, have a bus driver send the, the funds to their family. So they talk about how much easier it became as crypto is actually something that makes a really big difference for the continent, for South Africa, across the continent, where in the US, in Europe, it might be convenient, it might be an investment class, it might be fun to play with, but for Africa, this is something that makes a big difference uh, for people's daily lives and just the ability to have access to funds and maybe life-saving funds and assets. So how does it affect African diaspora? Opportunities for economic inclusion and empowerment, which Vijay will talk about more and I'm sure uh, we'll have other discussion as well. Uh, connecting African diaspora and the African continent because it's very hard to transact. I'm Nigerian on my father's side and you know, anytime we need to send funds between our family and in the US, very difficult, not easy to do, right? It's very hard to get funds movement. Uh, this makes a big change. Many blockchain projects, businesses, other opportunities. So this is like a new dot-com boom. For those of you who remember the 2000, there was a big dot-com boom. You had Facebook and Google come out of that. This is like the next round of that. But this is probably gonna be bigger because it's global. It's not just America, it's not just Silicon Valley. So there's a very big opportunity for Africa to leapfrog and jump ahead. And networking, creating global communities, very key. We want you know, connections all across African diaspora, Africa and the continent, and uh, creating a digital Wakanda is a little something that I work on. I That's called the Wakanda blockchain meetup, which is meant to connect us across the continents. So banking the unbanked, and you're gonna get a little more, I think Dr. Jones will touch about the access to kind of, uh, you know, connectivity and things like that. But we can see that Africa across the entire map, we have the most unbanked, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, All right? So crypto has the, and Bitcoin and digital assets have the potential to open this up where that 80% of Sub-Saharan Africa is unbanked. If they have access to a cellular phone, if they have access to any connection of any kind, they can become part of the financial community, right? They can do transactions. They can now become banked, at least in this finance 2.0 perspective, which is a great opportunity for Africa, for uh, the continent and for the diaspora as well. For that, This is my company, Auspicious Blockchain. This is something that we facilitate is doing crowdfunding, investing uh, from the diaspora into Africa, allowing the ability to invest in the continent. Just like a generation ago, China had a lot of diaspora invest back in, in China. We now want to also see a lot of Africa's diaspora whether African-American, African-Latino, in the Caribbean, in Europe, investing and being able to connect back to support projects across the continent, whether it be mining or farming or any different area across the continent. So our platform, uh, I'll leave details about that a little bit later so you can take a look at that. I will not play the video, but that's our, our goal and our mission is to be able to enable that type of investment from the diaspora into Africa and to build wealth for the diaspora and Africa in the process. I'm gonna move past that, so give me a second. And let's go on. This is my contact information, so if you need to reach me, um, I'll put most of this in the chat as well while Deidre is going on, but I'll leave it up here for a second. Uh, and Deidre, um, I believe your slides are next. So as I get ready to put this into the chat, um, Deidre, let me go ahead and hand it over to you. Are you ready to go? Yes, as long as you can run the slides on your end of yes. my presentation, I'll tell you when to switch. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me to share a little bit of insight on um, the African American uh, perspective on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. My name is Deidre McIntyre, and I'm the founder of Black People in Cryptocurrency, which is primarily an education and media vehicle to kind of get um, not just African Americans, if you notice, we use kind of use the Pan African colors, um, but to kind of connect between the African American um, and Caribbean and African communities, because we share something in common, which is the difficulty, as John mentioned, of being able to send remittance um, uh, and do actual, you know, business um, across borders. Um, we're kind of always left with the highest remittance rates and um, just overall difficulties. But my perspective is to give you insight <clears throat> on African Americans. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, our personal story, I'm not going to go through all of this um, in verbatim, but essentially I became aware of cryptocurrency in 2016 after there was, there was an article that one of the founders of PayPal um, was donating a tremendous amount of uh, millions of dollars to the former, our former president's campaign. And that is a, a basically a sore spot for a lot of African Americans in the community due, due to the kind of racial overtones of, of the previous administration. And so it got us thinking, you know, we can't catch a break here in the United States. You know, where, where can, what kind of technology can African Americans use to be able to send money or to do merchant services that doesn't involve someone that's supporting the far right? Um, and you know, kind of fostering a kind of climate that basically risks our lives. So uh, one of the people within my network who's actually a fellow member of my group, Bob Ponce, was like, well, you know, you need to look at Bitcoin. And that kind of set the ball rolling for studies in 2016. We ended up linking with a venture capitalist who since passed. And he says, yeah, I've been getting a lot of queries about this Bitcoin thing. I don't know it either. I'm the journalist, so they kind of all turned to me and dumped a bunch of website links, TED Talks, everything on me. And it was like, write something up and make it plain. And so that from 2016 was all studying. By the time we got to fall of 2017, I was noticing there were a lot of multi-level marketing um, entities that were targeting Africa, the Caribbean, and African Americans under this guise of, you know, paying monthly and we'll get the Bitcoin for you. And I already knew that's not how that worked. You know, you could have had $5, you could have had, you know, $10, you could have did it completely on your own, you know. And so it was like, okay, let's start a group that really started education on the fundamentals. And then let's also let them know that at that time in 2017, there were about 400 cryptocurrencies. And to give perspective now, there's probably more than 15,000 cryptocurrencies. So it's a fast growing field. Um, by um, 2019, uh, I was a little bit dismayed that more of the Black people that were in the space that had startups and or considered themselves professionals were not getting the media attention. They were not getting the media attention in the crypto um, news outlets nor the mainstream. And so I put a list together that basically said there were more than 125 people that uh, we had randomly found. And it didn't mean I met them personally, but just scouring websites, scouring YouTube, scouring Google, and we were just finding person after person after person that had quite a bit of history, years of history and writing things. So we put that list out there to kind of put it in the face that we're not invisible, that we are in space. Now fast forward to, uh, to, to, to 2020 is that when you have the first African-led, um, Kenyan-led specifically, uh, proof of work blockchain, and that's the WISE protocol. And, and John Karanja, who's head of GitHub Africa, many of you may know, um, is the lead engineer behind that. And that's monumental for us as African Americans because it goes back to our 2016 premise. What is something that we could use that we have a better shot that it is not a racist um, uh, giving funds to, you know, primarily people who support and go to, you know, racist factions, um, or just kind of dismiss the fact that it's ancillary to lower taxes uh, or, or, or lower fees that, you know, racism, black people just have to deal with it. So why is something that, uh, because they launched that blockchain, that we know that in the future, there's a place for us to build upon that hopefully is more uh, in tune with um, our livelihoods. Next slide. Um, we do a lot of uh, writing intermittently and also a lot of different live streams. This is some screenshots of some live streams that we've done um, with uh, the uh, actor and writer, Erica Alexander. Um, she had an NFT line. And then of course, that's John Caranja. We did a one-on-one. -on -one. And Bob Ponce, who's the other person there, that's the other person that was the one person in my network that knew Bitcoin before me and was throwing me all these links to kind of catch up in 2016. Um, we've also appeared in a number of, of conferences. Um, and I, because I'm more of an editorial journalist, I attend a number of op-eds and, and features uh, in the sector. Next slide.
Um, we assist and partner with a couple of people in the space. A lot, every single person on here has been in the space longer than I have. Uh, of course, I mentioned John before with Wise. Um, Eduardo Jackson actually has the oldest African American blog in the space called Blacks in Bitcoin, but his real project was to create a Hollywood predictions game. So if anybody's into fantasy sports and trying to come up with a, a, a team that measures the stats, uh, et cetera, et cetera, whether it's American football or global football, um, you know, it's his, he just does it with Hollywood films. So he has a cryptocurrency uh, that he just launched in this past October that's tethered to the game that he's been working on for the past uh, six years. Um, and of course, um, you know, kind of the mecca for us is the Black Blockchain Summit by Sinclair Skinner uh, of the I Love Black People movement. He's this is the oldest conference having launched in 2018. And it's kind of where I met, I met John and a whole bunch of people face to face. Um, and so that's kind of the brands that we kind of work the closest with. Um, but uh, we're pretty much open to open work, working with a lot of different people. Next slide. There's a lot of data. Um, I don't want to go too heavily into a lot of the data that surrounds um, African Americans. We study quite a bit. This was more of a general people of color one that um, uh, University of Chicago organization created. Uh, we, very recently in June of this year, and they said that 44% of cryptocurrency buyers are Americans of color, so that, of course, 11% of that number was um, Black people, and and, and uh, only 35% of the respondents said they only did stocks only, so it's kind of like a turning tide in the United States. Next slide. A little bit more data, um, you could probably read and go through this at, at a later date, but essentially what it's saying is that African Americans are basically um, somewhat abused, well, not somewhat, they're abused by their current financial uh, situation. We have a tendency to, um, you know, pay more in terms of, of um, banking fees and, um, as it relates to our mortgages, et cetera. But on the reverse side, we have a tendency to give more money to our family members and friends who are in need than as, than as compared to any uh, other demographic, as compared to at least white families and Latinx families. Um, and those are the two we were compared to, not necessarily Asian or Native Americans, but we were more likely to help um, friends and families uh, who are in financial distress um, and, but we're also more likely to be abused by, um, in terms of fees and other issues by the banking institution. And that kind of all sets the stage as to why cryptocurrency is viewed positively by um, African Americans as kind of like at least another option and help, help us um, for building um, family wealth. Next slide. Okay, so um, some of the ways in which African Americans participate into the space, um, holding, holding, I think is most off uh, common. So that's the idea of targeting it mostly on Bitcoin, which is kind of a sound strategy, um, and then just buying and holding and then just getting it there and then seeing how it's growth. Um, a lot of times online, you see people talking about speculating and jumping on coins and I made all this money, but we, we kind of, I think a lot of us realize that a lot of that is online marketers. Um, so a lot of what you see uh, in social media, Twitter, Facebook and stuff, is not necessarily what the average everyday person um, was doing. We actually had a, a small poll within groups about a year ago and it was, it was interesting to see that most people came forward and said that they were um, actually holding compared to the noise that was in the space. Um, the ideal is to invest in wealth for future generations. Um, we also are very conscious about building custom financial solutions. Um, and, you know, this idea that, that um, not only as individuals are we victimized by the banking system, but we also have a situation with farmers um, losing land in the United States. So in the 1920s, uh, and that was on that last slide as well. In the 1920s, um, black farmers had, you know, about, a, you know, a, there were about a, a million farmers and now the 11 million farmers. And now it's like extremely 
um, uh, small, it's like one percent of America's farmers are farmers. They're basically losing ma- land to the banks. Um, so this idea of being able to provide an economic base for us to continue to grow and to actually reclaim some of the land that we lost. Um, and building businesses internationally and um, internally as well. Um, looking, you know, a lot of times we have very difficult uh, means in, in getting merchant services and other, um, even using uh, PayPal and um, Stripe doesn't help us facilitate um, uh, any e-commerce in the Caribbean or Africa. So this idea that there's this platform that we can build something and have that commerce between regions um, is very important to the African-American community. Next slide. Okay, this is my contact information. I'd like to thank you for allowing me to share a little bit of insight on the African-American experience. And if you have any further questions, you absolutely can reach out to me and then I can be more specific. Thank you. Thank you, Deidre. And I'm going to go over to uh... Dr. Jones. All right, thank you very much, uh, John. Right, so I think you can hear me loud and clear. Great. There's quite a lot of talk and interest in the blockchain and the cryptos in Africa. But going back a little bit, it's what looking at some of the underlying um, uh, factors that have led to the growth of related related um, sectors, for example, financial technology and so on. And today I'm going just to focus a little bit on why Africa is actually in a very good place when it comes to the adoption and the increase in um, blockchain and also crypto uh, activities. So first of all, Africa is a region of opportunity for financial technology. And this one, I'm going to call it FinTech. There has been a lot of investments in the FinTech area in Africa over time due to its unique economic and demographic environment. Of course, we've heard very um, emphatically that Africa is characterized by a less developed financial infrastructure and primarily uh, also uh, by an unbanked population, about 60%. So access to financial services to the population has often been hampered. Now here comes now new technology to help improve this. And for this, we shall look at what I um, most people know as a fintechs, the technology that is driving financial services. So the content has already proven its readiness for fintech. It has one of the highest mobile phone penetration levels in the world. Now we find that in some countries it's more than ninety percent, more than ninety percent mobile phone penetration. In fact, in some, uh, for example, Kenya. Uh, Uganda, uh, Nigeria, and so on, you find that the number of mobile phones really per household is at least 2.5, two or two, three mobile phones per, house, per household. Now, that is really, really, really high. Now, currently, this fact that the mobile phone technology has I really created the environment where there's a fintech, what I call a fintech revolution in Africa. And this fintech revolution, we shall see later on, is fueled mainly from three main hubs within Africa. So the Southern Africa side, South Africa, we have the East Africa led by Kenya, and then you have the West Africa side led by Nigeria. Now, even though in the Sub-Saharan Africa, it is accelerating steadily. Well, in a region with a large number of unbanked citizens and a number of underdeveloped financial sector, fintechs are offering a revolution to boost the sub, southern, southern, South African, the South Southern African infrastructure. 
So we find that the Sub-Saharan Africa um, region is created a condition of growth promising. And this is where now the uh, blockchains and the cryptos are really riding the wave on. The growth potential of expanding the, for specifically the payment sector is emphasized by the expectation that there'll be a total number of close to 1 billion mobile phone connections by 2034. That's amazing. 1 billion mobile connections by 2034. Now, if you look at this, this is a tremendous amount of growth. And if you extrapolate it closely to even up to 2054, we find that the population of Africa is going to be close to 1.3 billion. So if you look at that, there's tremendous amount of opportunities uh, in this space. Next slide, please, John. Overall, the fintech landscape, we can divide into two groups. Those mainly that are providing financial services, what we call the core fintechs, and those that enable the provision of such financial services, and we call them the enabling fintechs. And you see these ones a lot uh, in, in a very um, interesting uh, proportion in the sa, um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. The core fintechs are arranged in seven distinct segments. I'll not look at all the segments together uh, today, but the focus is on the delivery of financial solutions and services to both citizens, individuals, and also businesses. So the enabling fintechs, on the other hand, are separated now into three segments that, and enable other business to provide financial services through an array of different channels. And you'll find that this is a specific area that the crypto is really now coming into uh, within the uh, African region. Next slide, please, Jen. The fintechs have gained, they really, uh, they have gained a widespread attention and have disrupted the financial sector across both the developing and the developed countries. Due to the low coverage of traditional financial services in Africa, the fintech sector has significantly grown over the past decade. There are close to a thousand plus active fintechs in the African continent. 80% of those are actually of domestic origin. The majority of enabling fintechs are also closely tied to payments. So you find that there's a lot of activity in the payment sector. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of talk later on on the blockchain and cryptos in this space. So this payment sector, they establish payments infrastructure in the region and thus further amplify the segment's leading, leading position. The fintech sector in the sub-Saharan sub 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 Africa comprises of 260 active companies. They're split mainly into local 80% and 20% of these are international players. The number of fintechs here, they have grown really and are growing at a rate of about 24% over the past 10 years. So already you can see this is a very um, uh, rich um, environment for the growth of uh, further innovation in this space. So like the fintech centers in more developed markets, the payment segment is the most dominant in the sub-Saharan Africa, mainly due to the large and banked population and also correlating high demand for financial inclusion. The high concentration of mobile phones in sub-Saharan Africa has also aided this um, growth. So the persistent need for financial inclusion will continue to drive the growth of this payment segment. Uh, segment. The payments such as banking, lending have also, are also growing rapidly and new ones such as within the insurance sector are also emerging. With the right amount of resources and support, I'm sure the sub-Saharan Africa sector is likely to really, really yield substantial returns going forward. So this is an area to watch very, very closely. So uh, John, the next slide, please. I'm not sure if they're in the right order. Is this the correct one? Uh, just go to the next one. Yeah, stop there. That's fine. 
So the three main fintech hubs uh, in Africa we've talked about, we, we've seen centers in the South, East and West, uh, West Africa. And these areas have been led by three countries, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, respectively. We've seen that the Southern African fintechs are predominantly located around Cape Town, Johannesburg, and so on. Argu arguably, this is the epicenter of um, uh, fintechs, actually, in the Sub-Saharan Africa. So South Africa harbors about a third, a third of all firms that participate in this ecosystem. As the most diversified hub, it exhibits greater similarity, similarities to the more developed markets. Its focus is strategically placed on the enabling, the enabling sector, the enabling financial technology segments, making the country one of the main contributors of growth of fintech across the continent. Then you also see within East Africa led by Kenya, Kenya is the second largest fintech hub. It hosts around 20% of the entire fintech landscape and has a stronger focus on the payments segment. So the Kenyan hub, which is located in Nairobi, is home to close to about 50 uh, uh, fintechs, and it's really increasing here. And then Nigeria, Nigeria fintech sector is the third largest hub and is growing rapidly, very, very rapidly at the moment. Most of its fintech base is based in Lagos, and like Kenya, the Nigerian fintech sector is dominated by payments, payment segments. So you, you also see a trend following within the blockchain and crypto in this space too. So to, the trends have shown that the focus of fintechs here is on the need needs of the retail sector. So the three main hubs disti distinguish themselves from the rest of Africa through their relatively more advanced uh, fintech ecosystems. And consequent, consequently, it's relatively relevant harbors of also investment opportunities. So those two are very important driving factors. And again, it's closely to what I call the mobile technology belt that is cutting across Africa uh, from the South uh, to the Central, Eastern Central Africa, going all the way to the West African region. So in addition of this, there are so many other developments in other African countries. We've seen Ghana, we've had what is going on in Uganda, Cameroon, Rwanda, and so on. So there's a lot of activity here. And again, it's a very common to see where the, this growth is relatively follows the, um, the, the technology and the scaling of increase in the mobile, mobile space in these countries. So given the increasing interest in the fintech segment, it is expected that the fintech ecosystem will further improve across more countries in Africa in the near future. And we are seeing it today. And a lot of it is driven by now the new interest in blockchain technology. So overall, Africa, I can say, is very, very well primed, is well primed for blockchain technology. Really, the facts and the figures explain it. We've seen the mobile technology penetration. We've seen the internet pen uh, penetration. We've seen also education and a lot of um, a mindset change that is happening in Africa at the moment that is really fueling and making it a very, very important space for growth going forward. So there's a lot to say uh, actually in this area, but I'll not go too much into the details. I've presented a little bit about the figures about some of the, uh, what is happening in the, in the sister space, which is a, a FinTech space, and which has consistently led to the growth of blockchain and crypto activity. And I'll just say that I'm very excited myself, uh, also as a player participating in this ecosystem uh, through uh, the Mindflix media uh, platform, uh, which we set up primarily to provide uh, an opportunity for we to begin to learn through intelligence to education uh, uh, within the space in Africa specifically. So Mindflix Media we, is, is a platform that we have uh, really coined or set up during this pandemic period to increase the knowledge, to provide opportunities for uh, the local entrepreneurs in Africa and also the diaspora investors to really come together and raise funds. So we do facilitate the raising of funds and then infusing IT resources so that we spur a bit of um, economic activity and get projects going. So this is really, really an area that we are 
uh, passionate about, and I'm sure all of us here are interested to see or hear what is coming next. And I'm very excited. Uh, thank you very much, John, uh, for uh, sharing my slides. And thank you very much for um, the uh, attendees for listening to my uh, presentation. I'll also put my details in the chat so that we can be able to follow up uh, later. Thank you very much. And Dr. Jones, thank you also. If you want to just remind me, and we go into the Q&A, there's a question about Northern Africa, if there's any hubs there. So if, if it's not, maybe we can address that in the Q&A at the end right. as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's go over to uh, Ian uh, Bellina, you there? Let's go ahead and go into some of the projects and some of the types of things people invest in uh, on uh, digital assets and cryptocurrencies. All right, yes, uh, thank you, John. So hello, everybody. My name is Ian Bellina. I'm the founder and CEO of Tokenmetrics. We're a data-driven crypto investment research platform that helps crypto investors become smart investors using data, analytics, and AI to invest in the space. I'm also the founder of a book called Crypto Investing Guide that's available on Amazon.com. We've sold over 12,000 copies in the last two months. Um, and I'm based here in Austin, Texas, and also was born in uh, Uganda, in uh, Kampala. So some of you may know my story from online. Uh, I have been in crypto since 2016 as an investor, quit my job at IBM to go all in on crypto because I saw crypto as the biggest transfer of wealth in human history. Um, and really for the first time seeing how anybody can really build generational wealth via crypto and the blockchain. So publicly people saw me via my, op my open source free spreadsheet turn about 20 grand, 20,000 20, US dollars into $5 million in less than one year. And that is something that's very unheard of in other markets and other industries. But this is something that's widely available for anybody, even Africans. And that's why I think Africa is positioned to do well in crypto because crypto is boundless. Crypto is borderless. Crypto is essentially building open finance for anybody to become a part of the next evolution of the internet. So for, for me, crypto allowed me to quit my job. I had a very nice job at, I, at IBM, was working there for four years, um, but I was dealing with basically uh, office politics, right? Especially being a black person and being African in the corporate world, that's always a challenge. But crypto allowed me to have financial freedom to go out there and become an entrepreneur and do, do basically anything I love, right? And that would not have been there without the freedom and the power of crypto. That's why I think crypto is so powerful for anybody, whether you're African or, or whatever, crypto lets you go out there and do whatever you want. So for me, I've been an entrepreneur for a while, um, but I was able to take my, my gains from crypto investing and at that time about $2 million and use that to launch what is now Tokenmetrics. Tokenmetrics recently just closed our last funding round. We've raised in total about $5 million at a valuation of over $80 million, right? But that would not have been possible initially without me being able to bankroll my own business, right? Because prior to that, as a college kid and with other ventures, I had tried going, going out there and talking to investors and it's always been challenging, right? Especially because if you go and look at all the metrics for companies that receive funding, very few of them look like us, right? So with crypto, now we have the, the economic power to go out there and bankroll what we love, right? By making gains in crypto, we can use that to channel that back to Africa and Pan-Africa. And for me, I believe Africa is positioned well to do well in the fourth industrial revolution because this is something that is borderless. And Africa has already been accustomed to uh, mobile money with M-Pesa. Right? And now as we evolve towards the next internet, I think people see Africa as the next frontier. And I think Africa definitely has to be involved in this because uh, with, the, with, with the other revolutions, it was very, very challenging. But now, by being early, we can get a, a leg up and be able to become a part of the crypto world, right? Because crypto, to me, is about disrupting finance and disrupting technology. What does that mean? Right? Because look at see finance, all the different services, whether banking, investing, lending, borrowing, uh, and others, those services have been known for having, uh, let's say, challenges with black people, African people. But now, crypto is about disrupting all of that. 
where something is completely peer-to-peer, -peer, with no middleman, no person there controlling and, and having archaic rules, whether it's a credit system, right? So now anybody can go out there and borrow money with no credit check, right? And that's powerful for people who are trying to join the next evolution of technology and the next evolution of finance, right? So for me, I think that's why it's very vital that all of us become involved in blockchain and crypto. Uh, and the next internet, right? So I view crypto now as still being uh, very early. Lots of people think right now it's very late to get into crypto. Maybe they missed the boat. But in my opinion, we're still very, very early. If you look just at, at America, less than 10% of the population owns crypto. And if you expand to the whole world, less than 2% of the population owns crypto. So, and my, my belief is that crypto will become the largest asset class in history. It will surpass regular money, right? And other, and other asset classes. But this is natural. Crypto is the evolution of currency and money online. Right? It's only natural that analog methods of currency become digital. And the blockchain technology has been the best innovation since the internet itself. Right? And when you start viewing everything as not just currency, but both currency and the next internet, and that currency powers the next internet, then you can see how powerful crypto can become. Right, so how do you go about investing in crypto? Uh, first thing as I would say is start slow. Um, dip your toes in. Don't go out there and put in the mortgage or the rent money and, and possibly lose money because crypto is still very risky. But with high risk comes high, high reward. So the way we basically educate our audience and customers at Tokometrics is to go through a framework for researching crypto assets. And that includes doing lots of due diligence Lots of due diligence on the projects. So the first element is doing fundamental analysis. What does that mean? That means going through the background of the team, their use case, their tokenomics, and making sure everything seems sound. And it's basically the first f filtration for figuring out whether or not a project could possibly be a scam or not. Uh, and once we, once we go through that, the, the next step of that research process is essentially doing a code review, going through and doing the actual technology. Now this part is somewhat challenging if you aren't a developer. That's why our platform does this for our customers via newsletters and via research. Um, and then the third part is basically going through and looking at the actual valuation. It's something undervalued. So basically to sum up, it's fundamentals, technology, then valuation. And all of them come, all of them basically help us figure out what products are undervalued. And the reason why they tie together is because crypto, you have lots of products that have great fundamentals, but no tech. And you have lots of projects that have great tech and no fundamentals. And you have projects that, that, that have both, but are overvalued, meaning that the price is likely to go down, even if it's a good project. Because right? to make money in crypto as an investor, uh, th 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 through my own experience, you have to find something great with the great fundamentals, great technology that is undervalued. And I define undervalued as something that has the potential to do a 10x return, meaning that $1,000 turned turns into $10,000 in that investment. So once you combine all that, you can find those hidden gems investing in crypto. Um, and my story, in essence, was done through that. Right? I worked in analytics at, at IBM, and when I got into crypto, my, a friend of mine from my college days back in DC said, hey, Ian, what do you, um, IBM's doing lots of stuff in the blockchain space with Hyperledger. Could you put me in touch with the director of blockchain at IBM? And I said, why do you care so much about that? Uh, and as he kind of basically took me down, down this rabbit hole of crypto, he told me, uh, he, was, he was my age at the time, 20, 27 black, launching a crypto hedge fund. And for me, that just baffled the mind, right? First of all, there were very few young people launching hedge funds, and very few of them were black. And to do one in crypto and Bitcoin, I just had to basically go down this rabbit hole. And the more I went down that rabbit hole, the more I fell in love with crypto. I ended up buying my first Bitcoin and my first Ethereum that very same week because I began to see how disruptive this is, right? Um, and I think this can be done for anybody out there. No matter where you are, I think crypto is something that is creating a world, a, a completely new internet where anybody can participate without having any central intermediaries or rent seekers. No governments, no banks, uh, no, no, no archaic policies. Is it's now really creating an internet and a, a financial system of inclusion. Um, so to kind of just wrap up, so 
I recommend if you want to get involved in crypto, to definitely go to our site, pocketmetrics.com. You can either join there as a customer or just click on our book. We do have an ebook version available for free for the crypto investing guide. It's basically our entire research team has gone through and put together a book that you can give to anybody who wants to get into crypto and have them become deadly as an investor in crypto. Right? It, it, it goes through, covers the basics from what is crypto, what is blockchain, how to invest in crypto, how to trade crypto, fundamental analysis, uh, how to go through and evaluate, uh, evaluate te technology, NFTs, DeFi, uh, and basically all these different topics and chapters uh, in the space that I think anybody who wants to get involved should know. I also do have a channel on YouTube where we, we, we post daily free videos. Let's go to youtube.com slash tokenmetrics. Uh, and essentially we have live streams, we have videos, because for us it's about really creating education for anybody who wants to go out there and learn about the space and learn how to invest and trade in crypto. With that, that being said, uh, feel free to contact me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Diary of a Made Man. And also email me, ian at tokenmetrics.com. Thank you, Ian. We're going to go into uh, the question and answer and discussion. So you guys can raise your hand in the, ch the uh, reactions in Zoom. You can also um, type in the chat. We have some questions there. I'll start handing those uh, out for people to answer. Um, Ian, if you want to include your uh, contact info in the chat so people can reach you as well, uh, if you want to do that, it'd be great. Uh, the first question we have is from John Paul. He said, some entities are promoting fake cryptocurrencies on the web. It looks like Africans are more vulnerable due to less exposure and to good information. Are there any initiatives in Africa aimed in cryptocurrency education? So um, I will open that first. Um, there is one that I am involved in, which is the Wakanda Blockchain and Cryptocurrency Meetup. So that information is in the chat. Uh, let me go over to uh, Ian, Dr. Jones, anyone else want to add uh, in response to that question? Uh, yes, yeah, I'll uh, take it. So, yeah, I think it's definitely something people have to be cautious of. And that's why having a great research framework to go through and be able to screen and filter out these scams using a proven method. So for us, it's really about using data and using projects or going through and seeing what projects have been successful and what data points made them successful. Right? Because, yes, there are scams in the crypto space, but if you go through and have a very thorough process to screen them out, it becomes easier as an investor. And sometimes you can do it by yourself, right? That's why having, I mean, because the entire pl platform is built on doing just that, helping, helping people go through and filter out scams. Now, we can't guarantee investment returns, but what we try to do is to filter out products that we know, this seems shady, this, this seems sketchy, right? And that can be done by going through the team's background, uh, their track record. Uh, in crypto, most common scams either are one, Ponzi schemes, and Ponzi schemes can be figured out using uh, basically their tokenomics, because uh, typically they'll have what people refer to as Ponzi-nomics, right? So for example, they'll have a very high uh, fully diluted valuation with a very low token su supply that's given out to, to, to the community with a large portion of the tokens, basically a majority or more than half owned by insiders, right? meaning that those insiders will dump on, on, uh, on their community. Uh, so the, the ways to go through and filter out those kind of projects and have a better chance to make money in crypto. All right, uh, Dr. Jones or Deidre, did you want to add anything? I think you're on mute, Deidre. Anybody want to add any further on that? Uh, right, right, I think I'll go ahead. I think one of the other things that I'd like to add on to uh, what Ian has said is uh, the fact that uh, uh, this is a space that requires constant education, really. So uh, infusing this within the mindset of uh, citizens of the continent is very, very important. Not just uh, giving um, uh, data alone, but also handholding and let, creating an exposure, an environment where we are exposed to some of these um, tools and activities working in real time. That's so, so important. And the second thing is just to be able to provide an opportunity for those of us who are in the diaspora, who now have perhaps a high exposure to really, really take an active role on the continent in this space. This will really create a big leading example for uh, the rest of us to follow. Thank you very much. Did you were you uh, commenting? 
Yeah, I was going to say that on the African continent, you have, um, at least for people that want to get into the space as uh, from a software engineering background, you have a Melanin Academy that is part of BitHub Africa out of Kenya. Um, and as far as the average everyday person that's not very technical, um, you know, uh, Blacks in Bitcoin was one of the oldest blogs, it's blacksinbitcoin.com. Um, our, our group on Facebook, Black People in Cryptocurrency, but essentially, you know, sometimes you can just use what you already know um, from previous experience. If something looks like a multi-level marketing scheme without crypto, it's going to look the same thing. Adding crypto to it doesn't make it less of a multi-level market. So if you hear code words like, you know, you'll get a team and there's an upline and a downline or whatever, and you're not into multi-level marketing, you can basically pass on on something that says it's related to crypto like that. Um, so, so sometimes, uh, and as Ian said before, you know what is written about the the actual project. If they say they have a website, are they just repeating vocabulary that sounds like Bitcoin and not saying exactly what they're doing? They're just using a lot of big words and vocabulary, and they can't convey what does this project do, and where can I see you doing it. And what products have you actually produced, or what's your roadmap to your first project? Uh, and and don't be shy about saying, well, I'll wait until after the first roadmap is met because you said you're going to produce an app at this date. And they keep stalling, stalling, stalling. So despite the volume of marketers and people rah rah and cheerleading, if they never meet any products and never meet any services. Those are all red flags to avoid. So I think you can a lot of times use, if you're a true, true beginner, you can use those instincts to kind of pull away and start segregating. And then it's also the most conservative route as you're reading and as you're studying, you know, Bitcoin is always like the safest thing to do micropayments. Don't think of it in terms of one Bitcoin is 60,000, 65,000, whatever it is. Like I have $25, how can I get $25 worth of $25 of disposable income, not, you know, you have to pay something with it. Uh, what can I get right now that has the lowest fees that is to get $25 worth? Because that's why I, that's my starting point. And then maybe a month later, maybe I'll do another 25 or something like that. As I'm reading and studying and learning about the wider ecosystem, which is more than 15,000 projects at this point. Okay, great. And I'm going to go over to, uh, we have a hand raised, Nandifa, said that correctly. Um, do you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question? Good, good day. Good day. Thanks for, to the presenters. Um, I think I wrote my questions, <clears throat> but, but I wanted to, to, to speak to the presentation that was on the, the intelligence, business intelligence one about the fin sector. And, and I wanted just to check uh, what could be affecting the various, um, in the Venn diagrams you have, um, for example, if you compare South Africa with, um, with Kenya, Kenya is, is becoming more grayer than South Africa. And South Africa is getting less into the banking and lending as compared to Nigeria and Kenya. What, what could be the contributing factor to that? And I'm asking this from the angle now going to the, to the crypto thing and, and saying, what, what, what is your stand regarding the current um, tightening of taxation around the cryptocurrency? That's one. The second one uh, is around the unscrupulous service providers. Unfortunately, and this is one area that people fall victim. But the question I have, which is, a, which is a, a consequence of the absence of education in this space. But my question then goes to the remedial action. For example, in the UK, you would find that there, there is an entity that deals with um, uh, the regulation of the sector and closing down of unscrupulous. But that's not where my focus is, is how the reinvestment of the normal men on the street gets done so that they don't lose confidence 
on this on these platforms. Okay, so I'm going to start and then I'll let our other panelists jump in to answer your question. Taxation is really from uh, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. I'm a trained lawyer. So in each jurisdiction, the taxation is going to be a question of where you are located, what is the taxing authority, where, you know, where you're a citizen of, what country. Um, and that's really like any investment, right? So if you're in a stock market in South Africa versus stock market that's in uh, Kenya, Japan, you're going to have the taxation depending on where you are located. Crypto is still evolving from a regulatory perspective, uh, but it's no different in that respect. It's usually treated as property in many different jurisdictions currently, by the way. Um, from the unscrupulous service providers, I'll let others jump in to discuss this point. It is, as Ian had talked about, this is a brand new space, right? So there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of wealth is being created, a lot of black wealth, I will say, a lot of African diaspora wealth, African wealth is being created. So there's a great opportunity, but the downside of that is there's gonna be a lot of scams. There's gonna be a lot of risk because where there's a great reward, you're also gonna have great risk, right? So if you go to a regular stock market, like in the US, right, where I'm from in the States, if you go there, you might make 10, 15% in the stock market if it's doing pretty well, and that's it, which is great, but you're not going to build life-changing wealth from getting 10 or 15%. On the other hand, if you're investing in Bitcoin, you might be getting 250% every year. Like Ian said, that is life-changing money, right? That's money that allows mm -hmm. you to bankroll. I've invested in my company, Ian's invested in his, a lot of other African diaspora, you know, have done the same, et cetera. So there is more risk, but of course, because you, and because you have more rewards, you're going to have more potential risk. Um, does anybody on the panel like to jump in to address this? I think I will, I will jump, I'll jump in and address there in particular also a comparison between South Africa and uh, Kenya in particular. Uh, of course, you've seen that South Africa has evolved very much close related to the evolution from the Western, uh, the Western world. So you find it's very closely linked to that, while the East African space is uh, really more um, geared towards the disruptive nature of technology. In other words, we have skipped in East Africa, we have skipped a, a huge regulatory framework that perhaps was uh, being um, uh, evolved in South Africa in a very ad hoc manner. So we find that this, while the space looks a bit confusing, the fact that uh, technology is coming to disrupt and create sort of um, ways in which, for example, we have the central banks are really figuring out how do they interact with this mm -hmm. new technology and new players. So this is something that we have in Africa, we have to evolve by ourselves. We cannot copy, we cannot copy the Western world. We have to figure out ways in which we, uh, we manage this. We've already seen, um, if you look at Nairobi, Central Bank has worked very closely with um, uh, Safaricom uh, to create some form of unique regulatory framework for the Kenyan space. Uh, mm. and, and this has not been adopted from the Western world and so on. It's basically African minds, East African people themselves coming together and figuring out how do we solve this problem. And I believe the same also should apply to all other African countries, especially South Africa, working in this space. So it's very, very important uh, to see that uh, it has to be a bottom up led activity not just top down alone. We have to see what is going on, what is going on in the written space, what is going in the farming space, what is going on in the uh, supply chain and the logistics, and how, how, how is the economy benefiting? And then perhaps building uh, regulatory frameworks and taxation principles that are really effective. So I think that's what I would say that needs to be done on a wider scale on the African continent. And to do this has to be, of course, a lot of education, really. We have to have new startups in this space, in the space mm -hmm. for education, uh, whether it is economics, whether it is um, uh, banking, whether it is in technology and so on. We need, we need to see that coming up. Yeah. And Dr. Jones, thank you. We have, uh, I'm gonna do a quick lightning round because we're almost out of time, but we have a few more questions I wanna address. So if we can just do a quick, really snappy response. Dr. Jones, I think for you, what, about North Africa was asked, is there any hubs there for FinTech? 
Uh, right, North Africa is an interesting one. It's coming up very quickly and we are seeing Egypt leading, Egypt, Tunisia and Algeria. So we are seeing startups now beginning to grow in, this, in that space and also investments flowing. So if you're interested in North Africa, watch those three countries uh, uh, very closely, Egypt, Tunisia and Algeria. Okay. And we have another one here, why people are reluctant to join the crypto market. I'll, I'll quickly uh, indicate FUD. You may not have heard of that. It's fear, uncertainty and doubt. There's a lot of that that goes out in stories and articles and different news reports about this market. Um, and I think that is one of the reasons that people are reluctant. I'm not sure, Ian or Deidre, would you like to make any other comment? Lightning round. No comment. I think I did it in the chat. I saw it in the chat. I don't know if you could hear me. I just responded to Sam and by saying that um, looking at um, sites like coinmarketcap.com are helpful to for you to look at the different cryptocurrencies and see the buying and selling activity. Um, somebody asked if there was like an oversight agency that can determine, you know, what is a good investment and what is not. The, the point is that you are that oversight agency. So do you have a value in a utility for, you know, Bitcoin? Or do you have a value and utility in some other cryptocurrency that exists or one that you need to create for maybe um, a church community, a religious community, or, or uh, a, a social community that you know it would be valuable because you designed it to fit the needs of that specific, and then you made it fungible with um, Bitcoin or Ethereum or some of the other cryptocurrencies. So you, people have to realize that Cryptocurrencies are built on what's called open source um, technology. So that means that the reason why there are so many cryptocurrencies, even with bad actors, um, there are a tremendous amount of good actors. The, the reason is, is because if you don't find a cryptocurrency has the dynamics, um, you can have a team of engineers actually design something and it fits with the rules of the pre-existing community cryptocurrencies in terms of what is uh, what are the standards that make it valuable. So if you can design something that what is called fungible, where it fits the rules of something else, you can custom design your specific group to meet your specific community and then say, well, the roadmap to, to my crypto is that you have to buy Bitcoin and then based on um, based on Bitcoin, um, you can buy our cryptocurrency at you know maybe a, a, a fractional amount of that. So you, you know, if you're confused, what to, just look at the buying and selling activity. So, granted, some people are just buying to hold on to some of the more valuable coins, but other people are buying in. And, and there's these, these sites that report, you know, this amount of Bitcoin was bought and then that wallet sent, it looks like they exchanged to this currency. So they're buying into projects being built in the space. And, you know, fundamentally, like the leaders, you know, our, our IBM, uh, where um, Ian works as well. Uh, but if you look at, you know, um, you know, Microsoft is trying to foray in with Azure and um, Amazon Web Services does a lot of things with Ethereum. If you look at the, the major brands and the major corporations, they're also dibbling and dabbling with um, building infrastructure on a lot of the pre-existing cryptocurrency if they're not launching their own coins, such as um, JP Morgan and other banking institutions. So if you just want to just kind of study and look around and say, okay, what is this coin and who's building on it? Um, 